So uh, I wanted to take a quick survey first. Uh, how many people here have heard of Zappos prior to this? And how many have actually shopped with us before? Okay, that's a pretty fair number. Usually uh, most of the men have not heard of it. And, uh, but then we just tell them, ask your wife or girlfriend or uh, significant other. And we actually had the uh, chairman of Warner Brother Records come through and I don't think he had ever ordered from us, but he had this vague idea that his wife maybe had. Uh, and he, so he had asked his wife, well, how much have you bought from Zappos? And the wife refused to tell him the actual <laughs> um, So during the tour, he stopped by our call center and sat down with one of the reps and was like, can you just look up my wife's account, please? <laughs> and uh, it turned out to be over $62,000 in the past few years. So um, anyways, uh, wanted to, uh, that's not our typical customer. Um, wanted to give a quick background on how I, what got me to Zappos. I actually, uh, I guess it starts back in college where I was running a pizza business with a college roommate. And we were actually, we invested in ovens and we're actually hiring workers and you know, making the pizzas ourselves and figuring out what the menu was. And this guy named Alfred, who today is the CFO and CEO, COO of Zappos, um, would stop by every night. Now, in college, we used to go out to dinners a lot, and we would call him the human trash compactor because he would finish everyone's plates whenever we went out to dinner. And whatever leftovers people had, he would finish everyone's plate at the dinner table. And so it wasn't that weird that he would come by every night and order a large pizza. But then sometimes he'd come back just two or three hours later and order another large pizza and walk off with and use his frequent diner's card and, and so on. Well. I found out several years later he was taking them up to his rooming group and selling them off by the slice. So that's why he's our CFO and CEO. Um, so after college, my, the roommate I was running the pizza business with, he and I started a company called Link Exchange. And this was back in 96 during the whole first dot com boom. And uh, we grew it to about 100 or so employees, and it was an online advertising network. By the time we sold the company to Microsoft in 98, uh, we had about a million websites in our network that were exchanging ads with each other. And one of the things that people actually don't know is the reason why we ended up selling the company. And the reason was because when it was five or 10 people, it was a lot of fun. It was you know, like every other dot-com at the time, we were sleeping under our desks, had no idea what day of the week it was, showering occasionally, but having a lot of fun, and we had a great culture. But we didn't know any better to look for culture fit when we hired people, so we ended up hiring people with the right skills and experience, but by the time it was 100 people, it just wasn't a fun place to go to work for anymore, even, even for me. I had that same feeling of, that I think a lot of people have of just waking up in the morning and dreading going into the office. And that was a really weird feeling for me because this was a company that I co-founded and now I didn't want to be a part of it. And so we ended up selling the company to Microsoft and then Alfred and I got together and formed a small investment fund and we invested in about 20 or so different internet companies, and Zappos just happened to be one of them. Zappos was started in June of 99, and we invested in August of 99, and so my role for the first year was just as an advisor and investor. Well, over the course of the year, it became clear that Zappos was both the most fun and the most promising, so I ended up joining full-time, and I've been there for ever since uh, 2000 full-time. <laughs> And we've, it's been about nine years now. So most people, when they hear Zappos, know us for shoes. Right now we have roughly about nine million customers, which is paying customers, which is about 3% of the US population. But really internally, we think of our company pretty differently. We really want the Zappos brand to be just about the very best customer service and the very best customer experience. And in fact, today we're actually selling a lot more than just shoes. We sell clothing and handbags, even electronics and cookware. And our hope is that 
10 years from now, hopefully people won't even realize that we started out selling shoes online. And they just know the Zappos brand to be about the very best customer service and customer experience. And we've even had customers email us and ask us, will we please start an airline or run the IRS? <laughs> and so um, we're not going to do that this year. But 30 years from now, I wouldn't rule out a Zappos Airlines. That's just about the very best customer service. So one brand we kind of look for, towards for inspiration is Virgin. Virgin does music, they do airlines, and a whole bunch of other things. And the difference is that the Virgin brand is more about being hip and cool. We just want to be about the very best customer service and experience. So on the customer service side, there's a whole bunch of things that we do. You know, it's free shipping both ways. We do a surprise upgrade to most of our customers. Uh, we promise they'll get their shoes in four or five business days, but most of them, they actually get a surprise upgrade to overnight shipping. And because we run our warehouse 24-7, which actually is not the most efficient way to, to run a warehouse, the most efficient way is for the orders to pile up, and then you have higher picking, picking density uh, and, and so on. And, but because we run it 24-7, a lot of customers order as late as midnight Eastern, and then it's on their doorstep eight hours later. And that just creates that wow experience, that emotional uh, experience for the customer. And it causes them to remember Zappos specifically and really drives the repeat customers. They purchase from us more often. They spend more money with us. And probably most importantly, they tell their friends about us. And that's really how we've grown over the past nine years. The number one driver of our growth has been from repeat customers and word of mouth. If customers call our, we call it our customer loyalty team, which is our name for our call center. Uh, well, first of all, they can call us. Most websites, it's pretty hard to find contact information for customer service. It's, if it's there at all, it's five clicks deep, and you have to really look for it. We kind of take the complete opposite approach, where we'll put our 1-800 number on the top of every single page of our website, because we actually want to talk to our customers. And we don't have scripts. We don't upsell. And uh, every rep is actually trained so that if a customer is looking for a specific pair of shoes, and let's say we're out of stock of their size, to look on at least three other websites. And if they find the shoe on another website, to direct the customer to the other website. And the whole philosophy is we're not interested in trying to maximize any individual transaction. What we're trying to do is build a lifelong relationship with the customer and make that relationship as personal as possible. So our guide to our reps is you know, don't worry about scripts. Just be yourself and make sure that you go above and beyond for the customer. So given that we want our brand to be about customer service, you may think that our number one priority is customer service, but it's actually not. Our number one priority from the company is company culture. And that's for two reasons. One is I want to make sure that I don't make the same mistake again that I did at Link Exchange. And, uh, and, also, and it's not just for me. I think we would ideally like all our employees to look forward to coming into work every day. And the second reason is because, really, as the web makes every company more and more transparent, whether they like it or not, because any customer or employee can blog and you know, depending on whether it's, you know, how powerful the message is, it can, it can, and we've seen that ourselves, been read by millions of people. We believe that your company culture and your company's brand are really just two sides of the same coin. Like, the brand may lag the culture, but sooner or later, they're gonna, it's going to catch up. And I, I think that's why a lot of large companies that have been around for a long time are struggling right now, because you know, they're in culture that's inside their companies does not match the brand that they ideally would like to project. It's just very different from 50 years ago when you know, a few people could sit down and decide, this is our brand, let's just spend a lot of money on TV advertising and tell the world what our brand is. And the consumer really didn't have that many people to talk to or, or hear from except from you know, just a few of their actual friends and what was being said on TV. Whereas today, you know, any, anyone can do research, and it doesn't even have to be research. Take the airline industry, for example. 
you know, what is the brand of the industry as a whole? And I think most people will say it's about bad customer service. And I'm sure no airline decided, oh, we want our brand to be about bad customer service, right? So, so companies are struggling with not being in control of their brand because it's just not the way it, it today it can't be done the way it used to be done. So our belief is that if you do get the company culture right, most of the other stuff, like great customer service, will just happen naturally on its own. And you don't need to worry about coming up with a process or procedure for every possible customer touch point, because there are so many touch points that you can't possibly even anticipate that trying to control the message is not going to work in today's world. So I'll uh, tell a story of uh, this happened about nine months ago where we had a woman that was ordering a pair of shoes that she had been looking for for a long time for her husband. And searched all over the place, finally found them on Zappos, and was very excited, bought them uh, as a surprise for her, her husband. And uh, the shoes arrived overnight, and, um, and she was excited to show them to her husband, but unfortunately, on the way home, her husband was killed in a car accident, and so never actually got the shoes. And so she called our customer loyalty team and wanted help with the return process. And you know, like any good company would, we helped her through the return process. But um, what the rep did after that was she took it upon herself to send flowers to the widow to show our condolences as a company. You know, now, this situation doesn't happen you know, very often, so we don't have a process or procedure for this. And so when the woman received the flowers, she was so touched that you know, a company would care enough you know, to actually send flowers that you know, two days later at the funeral, the woman told the 30 or 40 friends and family members that were there, and not only is that woman a customer for life now, so are the other 30 or 40 people that were at the funeral. And you know, if you look at it on an individual transaction basis, you know, clearly that not, was not profitable, and you know, if you had to go through what most call centers have to go through, where the rep would have to seek approval from a supervisor, and, and then it would probably end up not being approved. That would have never happened. But because we hire for culture and make sure that everyone understands the vision of the company is just about the very best customer service and customer experience, then stuff like that just happens naturally on its own. And I'll talk a little bit about how we hire for culture. We actually do two separate sets of interviews for everyone that's hired. And uh, it doesn't matter what your position is. This isn't just for our call center. We, the standard, we do the standard set where hire, the hiring manager and his or her team you know, interview for uh, fit within the team, experience, technical ability, and so on. But then our HR department does a separate set of interviews purely for culture fit. And they have to pass both in order to be hired. So we've actually passed on a lot of really talented people that we know would make an immediate impact on our top or bottom line. But if they're not a culture fit, we won't hire them. And the reverse is true, too. We will actually fire people if they're bad for the culture. So even if someone is doing their individual job function perfectly well, if they're doing something that's bad for the culture, not living up to our core values, we will and we have actually fired them. Other things we do is everyone that's hired into our headquarters in Las Vegas, doesn't matter what your position or title is, you could be a lawyer or software developer or call center rep, goes through the same training, four weeks of training that our call center reps go through. And that includes going over company history, our philosophy about customer service, the importance of company culture, and then you're actually on the phone for two weeks taking calls from customers. And then we send you to Kentucky for a week, which is where our warehouse is, 
and you do all the shipping functions, picking, packing, shipping, receiving, and so on. Mm -hmm. So this is for all of our hires in Las Vegas, which is basically the entire company minus the uh, warehouse operations. And during that process, too, we found that it's a good way to weed out people to make sure that our culture is as strong as possible. Uh, we've actually had, uh, a few months ago, someone that was a relatively senior level manager that we had actually even relocated from LA. And uh, we, it became clear within the first week or two that he thought customer service was below him and you know, would show up late to class and so on. And so we actually ended up firing him during the training and, uh, and then relocating him back to LA. So, so we really believe that you know, the culture is so important. And yes, you know, there will be short-term pain in terms of filling positions and in terms of the cost of training and, and so on. But really, it makes the company so much stronger in the long term. I wanted to tell another story of a uh, woman that ordered a wallet from us. And you know, she received it overnight and then you know, tried it out, decided it wasn't really quite right for her. And so she returned the wallet to us with the free shipping. But what she didn't realize was that during her testing phase, she had left $150 inside the wallet and returned that to us as well. <laughs> um, and so she had two kids and spent the next couple days running around the house you know, trying to get one of them to fess up. She was sure one of them had taken it, wasn't sure which one, or maybe they were in on it together. Um, <laughs> But then a couple days later, she got a letter from the warehouse worker that had processed the return. And it said, just want to say we received your return. Thanks for your return. Um, but notice there was $150 in it. Thought you might want it back. And so, <laughs> so here it is. And you know, that woman then called us to you know, thank us and uh, tell us that because of that one act, she has told all her friends, and she is now a customer for life as well. And so, you know, this is a warehouse worker that's working for a close to minimum wage, and the warehouse worker could have easily pocketed the money, and no one would have known. But because we also in the warehouse hire for a culture fit and make sure they understand the company vision, then you know, that type of stuff happens naturally on its own. Or the other approach we could have taken, which probably most companies would do, is you know, set up a bunch of processes and procedures and set up all the security and strip search the uh, warehouse workers on the way out, but that adds a additional expense as well. So you know, we don't have to do all of that. And it just goes back to, it's not just about the call center. You know, customer service for us is the entire company. And that's why we make sure we hire for culture fit throughout the entire company. Um, and then wanted to end with uh, one, uh, I guess, more fun story, which is uh, this was about a year ago when I was speaking at a sales conference for Skechers, which is one of our brands that we work with. And uh, we had the conference during the day. And this was out in Santa Monica, and so a bunch of, there were a few Zappos people and a few Skechers people, we all decided to go bar hopping together. And um, I wasn't here last night, but I, I heard you guys had a good time. And so you know, we wanted to have a good time as well. And so we kept bar hopping and probably hopped one or two too many bars uh, throughout the night and actually end up shutting down whatever the last bar we were at was. And so we all wind up at someone's hotel room, and uh, there were six of us, and half Skechers, half Zappos. And the Skechers person, she said, you know what? I could really, really use a pizza right now. And so she calls room service. And unfortunately, room service doesn't deliver hot food after midnight. So. You know, the rest of us from Zappos were like, oh, you should just call Zappos. And, you know, we're all about customer service. And, you know, so it's, 
at the time, we really thought it was the funniest thing ever. And so, um, so she kind of took us up on our dare, and she uh, put, called Zappos and put it on speakerphone, and the rep didn't know that the rest of us were in the room. And she's like, you know what, I'm in Santa Monica right now, and I could really, really use a pizza. And, you know, and then there's kind of an awkward silence for a little bit. And then the rep says, you know, you called Zappos, right? We don't actually sell people. She's like, yeah, but the hotel, like, they won't serve hot food after midnight. I don't know what to do. And uh, the rep goes, okay, hold on. And puts her on hold for two minutes and then comes back and with the list of the five closest places to Santa Monica that were still open for pizza <laughs> so, and delivering pizza. So um, I hesitate a little bit to tell the story because I don't want all of you to start <laughs> calling me. Uh, but, you know, that's just an example where if you get the culture right, then most of the other stuff like great customer service just happens naturally on its own. So one of the things that uh, we do at Zappos is we have something called a culture book. And this is something that we put out once a year. And we ask all of our employees to write a few paragraphs about what the Zappos culture means to them. And except for typos, it's unedited. So it includes both the good and the bad. And it's organized by a department. So you can see how the merchandising culture might be slightly different from the warehouse culture. Uh, this is actually, I'm going to have a copy with me for people to look through. Uh, during the break, but I'm also happy to send anyone here a copy. Just email me, Tony at Zappos.com, and along with your physical mailing address, and get a copy of the uh, culture book out to you. Um, and then I guess the final thing, actually, I want to talk about culture because people do ask, you know, what exactly do we mean by culture, and what are our core values? If you just do a Google search for Zappos core values, uh, we will hopefully be the first result. That shows up. Uh, and so that, that lists our 10 core values. And we actually have interview questions des designed to uh, really see how good a candidate fits into each of those core values. But you'll notice that our core values are actually not what you might find at most corporations or uh, large companies. Because most companies have, they might call them core values or guiding principles or something else like that. But they're always very lofty sounding, and they all sound the same. And so it really doesn't differentiate any company from the other. I was actually speaking at a UPS conference once where I read out a mission statement and asked if it sounded like theirs. And they all raised their hands, and it was FedEx's mission statement. <laughs> and so, um, so, so the point for the important thing for us when we went through our process, and this was a year long collaborative process with all of our employees where we asked them for what they thought our core values should be. But the most important thing is make sure that they're committable core values, meaning that you're willing to hire people only for, based on those core values. And you're willing to fire people if they don't live up to the core values. And if you're not willing to do that, then you know, you're, by definition, you're not willing to commit to those core values. And it's better to come up with less lofty sounding core values that are committable than to come up with something that you know, might look good in a press release or something. So um, that's it. So thank you very much. <laughs>